Today's scripture is found in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. You can find that on page uh, 942 in the Puback Bible. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body belonging to sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he now lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let us not sin, therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace." This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. I don't know. It'd be it'd be very interesting to uh, maybe we could do this in uh, coffee hour afterwards. But to hear how you experience that worship set, because to be honest, like when we like put that out there that we're doing some throwback worship, some older stuff. It was funny to hear. Um, some of the older saints be like, I thought we were going to go further back than that. <laughs> so it's interesting because like, I'm just riffing here, but like, it, it's interesting because like, it just, like they're not super old songs to me. And I, I thought a little bit that this was going to be like music appreciation, which was one of my favorite classes in high school. And like, we could just all... If you can look back, you can look back and think, you know, positive thoughts. Or if you maybe like grew up with these songs and your parents sang them and they're your parents' songs and life was pretty good for you. And, and um, but for me, what was surprising, let's see if, let's see if I can even say it. Um, what was surprising this morning is sitting there and singing them. And one of the benefits of, of growing older and walking with the Lord for years is those songs each represented seasons of my life where God had been there, where some of those songs were such important um, scaffolding and grace in, in seasons of hardship and darkness and struggle. And that just all hit me. Like it was like memory in my gut that came back that I didn't know I had. Uh, and so it was just a very sweet time to sing with you. And so if you, if you had a different experience than that, um, don't, don't worry about it. But it would be interesting to know how you did experience it. Um, one of the things that I just thought about was like, it just reminded me um, doing those songs about the timelessness of the truth and the continuousness of, of, of God's praises among his people and the saints worship. And so I just pray that God would help us never stop singing. And, um, and, and all those new songs that we have, just be aware how God's working in those songs and the new songs that are being written today in the same spirit of God is, is lifting you up and supporting you with his truth and his love and his grace. And so, um, I was so, so thankful for that this morning. Um, 
today we get to pick up the book of Romans again and dust it off. And we've been in this gospel culture series and we've been preaching on what it looks like to take this gospel that we've been talking about the past five chapters and put it into practice in all the different ways and, and sectors of your life. And, and today we get to open up chapter six and emphatically read it. Jeff and I were talking about this morning about like, I, I wanna read it with the emphasis that, it, that it's designed to have, to emphatically read it and look at it um, as we get to talk more about God's grace today. And I don't know like if you've ever had conversations with people where like, it was surprising that you started to have a conversation, you thought it was gonna go really well, and it didn't. Like, you're like, oh, I thought that was gonna go great, and they took it the wrong way, <laughs> you know? And you're like, oh, you know, now I'm in the, I'm in the mess here. Um, and that is sort of what's happening this morning with, with, with what Paul's talking about, because he's been talking about um, how the gospel impacts your life. He's talking about how for, for since the beginning of chapter one in Romans, that salvation in Christ is by faith alone. It's, it's by grace and through faith and nothing else, nothing else. Doesn't matter where you were born, what side of town that you live on. It doesn't matter that your dad was a pipe fitter or that your dad counted other people's money. Like, it doesn't matter that you were born Jewish or that you were born a Greek. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. All that matters in our faith house is that Jesus died on the cross and that faith to believe and the grace given to me to do that is what saves us. He's riding into this church in the first century in Rome that's got all these Jewish people and all of these Greek people. They all have different foundations. And he's uniting them through the doctrine of the gospel through orthodoxy, through the foundation of God's word. He's uniting them to this idea. And as he moves through that in, in chapter five, he's, he's talking um, in chapter five about how we have peace with God in this faith. How we have peace with God, how this, this faith like leads us through the obedience of Christ to erase the disobedience of your father, Adam to erase that and bring harmony and peace and shalom back into the relationship that we had with God and lost in the garden in the fall. That's, that's where he's sort of picking up and, and, and talking this morning about grace. And so here's, here's what he's going to address. Because like it's, it's weird that when we get into talking about grace, that grace creates new questions. Right, like that it has to have this cascading amount of questions of like, if salvation is because of grace and you can't lose that salvation because of grace, then won't that encourage people to keep on sinning? Like it brings up these cascading questions. Another one is, does the gospel message lead people to change sinful patterns in their life? Or should we just sort of focus on staying under grace? Like there's those questions that are surprising that come up from this. But God addresses it himself in his word. He addresses those things. He doesn't leave us in the dark. I love the book of Romans. It does that so often. And the three things that we're gonna look at today is that he shows us that grace abounds being united with Christ. If you wanna know the answer to those questions, you have to have that first, that grace abounds when we are united to Christ. He shows us that grace means that you are truly dead to sin and you are truly alive to Christ. And he, he, he lets us know that grace means that not only are those things true about you, but that you are indeed an instrument of righteousness. That's the three things we're gonna look at. Let me pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this morning, for just a great morning to worship you, to sing um, throwback songs <laughs> that, that are those timeless truths. Lord, we, we thank you for uh, the many graces that we experience. So many, I think, that we experience every day that we just, we're not aware of. Like, we're not aware of, of how you're moving in our lives. Lord, I pray... Um, this morning, that you would lead us to truth 
in the simple truth that our new life in you, um, it, it has such power. It has such promise. And, and it's like the kind of gift that just sort of like um, always stays new to us and keeps, keeps on giving new precious gifts. And so I pray that that reality this morning of the gospel of grace would capture our curiosity and our attention and, and may it transform our desires and our affections even this morning. Um, Lord, we ask that you would do whatever that you would want to do this morning through, through proclamation, through, through uh, response, through coming to the Lord's Supper, to all the things that we'll do before we walk out of this place. Would you convict us if we need conviction? Would you correct us? Would you provoke us, God? Would you protect us from the evil one? God, would you... Would you love your people and provide for your people in this space? And would you help me to glorify you in this moment? And may you refresh and renew the church and the gospel. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Chapter 1, it says, what shall we say then? So building on everything that we just talked about in Romans 1 through 5, what shall we say then? He's just talking about um, grace and peace and how we have this relationship with God because of grace. What shall we say then to that? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Like that's the, that's the immediate um, idea in, in that, that he has is that he's anticipating what they're going to say to this message of grace. And Paul does this all the time. And it's funny because when you read the gospels, you see Jesus doing it all the time, right? Like in the gospels, he just knows what other people are thinking and what they're thinking. And so, um, and so Paul's like, hey, I anticipate, here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna start thinking about grace the way all humans do with, with the truth of scripture. Like, right? Like, have you ever just like um, taken parts of the gospel and you like hyper-focus on them because they just make you feel so much better, right? And there's parts of it that you're like, I wanna kind of ignore that part. Right, like that's what Paul's anticipating is that that's human nature. Like we all have the tendency to do this, to kind of take our build-a-bear Jesus and kind of construct it the best way we would want a savior. He knows that we have the tendency to do this. And so he's talking about grace. He's like, hey, this, this is gonna be asked. They didn't ask it. And so he asks this rhetorical question that he doesn't mean for them to answer. What shall we say then? Are we going to continue in sin that grace may abound? Like, grace is so good. Like, it's, it's such an amazing gift from God that, like, if I just kept sinning more and more, and the more that I would sin, the more I would experience this grace. Like, that's the idea. That's the idea he's addressing here. And, 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 it, and he's like, should I do this so that it about? Now, the reality is, is that you don't have to do that. Because as you grow older in Jesus Christ, you become more aware of your sin and that grace is more and more and more precious to you. You're like, wow, there's more of my sin. You don't have to make more, it's gonna be revealed to you. Like that's what the Holy Spirit does. And you're like, wow, and God still saved me and I'm still saved, wow, that's grace. It's like, you don't have to do that. He says emphatically, by no means, like, no way. Like, what are you thinking? Like, why would you think that way? The anticipation of what people try to do to the gospel to, to meet their needs, to make things better for them. That, that God's grace is so good that the work of Christ so satisfied your past, your present, and all your future sin you don't have to sin more to get more of that grace. Like the whole time you're here on earth, that sin's going to be there. You don't have to try to find it. Like it's going to be there. Paul's like, no, like that's not how we should think. There was a commercial years and years ago where they would, uh, there would be two guys talking and one guy would just say something so foolish. The whole, the whole commercial is this way. Just telling his buddy how something that's just so dumb and so foolish. And the other guy's like, brilliant. <laughs> He's like, brilliant. And Paul's like, this is not brilliant. You guys, this is not how we should think. 
Stop thinking that way. Stop thinking that way. By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. So he gives a strong rebuttal. He answers, tells them, don't take the beauty of God's grace in the gospel and handle it this way. This is antithetical to the gospel itself. We're not understanding the gospel of grace if we cheapen grace. We're not understanding it if we cheapen it. Grace is costly. It costs Jesus his life. We're not understanding grace. He's saying, hey, the way you need to understand grace is to give you this picture that you were buried in that tomb. That, that when Jesus died for your sins and his blood was poured out on Calvary for the forgiveness of your sins, they took his body from there and they prepared it for burial and they, they put him in a tomb on a cold slab of stone. It was prepared in there, the rock, the stone was rolled in front of that entryway. And Paul's saying you were in there at that time. Like you were there. You were laying on the slab next to him dead. Like that's, that's the picture that we get. We were buried with him by baptism into death. That's what baptism is. It signifies us going into the grave and us experiencing real death, real death with Christ, united to him in that moment. So right away we can see this revelation, like this idea of, 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 of who we are has changed. And, and what's unique about this is that one commentator was saying that like in this day, in this age, as this is read, as the idea of us being buried with somebody, it would have been heard by the hearers of that day in a very familial way. Like I, my whole family, like my, my entire family um, growing up had been cremated. So if I lost a, a grandpa or aunt and uncle or whatever, um, they, they've all been cremated. My dad was cremated, so that's all I know. That's my world. Um, my mom's side, they, they, bury, they bury by couple. So there's you know, a couple here and a couple there. But, but if you go back 100 years, all of our families buried themselves with their family, generation in and generation out. The family cemetery was a big deal. So that was, that was just something that if you just look back a, a hundred years into, into our lineage, the Barrage lineage, that's, that's a reality. And that's how they would have heard this. That, that you died not just to like some version of, of your old self, but your entire lineage. That you're, you died with your family. You're, you're cut off completely from your lineage that means like to me that like the tendency of, of my dad and my grandpa and his dad to be abusive, to be addictive, to be full of sin, like I've been cut off from all of that. That's what grace means. Like, and that's, that's how they would have understood being buried with somebody. That like we're cut off from our old life. And, and that's a reality you have to try to embrace inside of your um, weird family system that you probably have, right? Like you have to go, how is that the case? But Jesus sort of made that clear, didn't he? He said, who, who's my mother and who are my brothers? Like that is a reality in the gospel that our entire position at the deepest parts of us has changed locations. And Paul's like, you've got to see yourself if you want to understand grace in the tomb dead. That you really did die there. So that you can then see something else. That, that you can see that you were buried with him. So that, I could, so that I could really wrap my mind around, I'm no longer Orion Barrage, the fourth son of Barnett Worth Barrage. 
and the heir to all his stuff. That I could see myself as somebody who has grace abounding in me as I'm united to my Savior who has cut me off from my old life in all of my old ways and all of my old self. Grace abounds when we're united to Christ. Not when we play games with our sin, not when we hide our sins, not when we brush over them, but when we realize that they are forgiven in Christ. And he shows us more. Verse 4, we were buried, therefore, with him in baptism into death in order. So here's the purpose. In order, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, he shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So not only are we buried with him and cut off from the debt of our old life, but then that stone rolled away. That stone rolled away and the glory of the Father and the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit brought Jesus back to life and you also, and you also. And the way that God heals in the gospel isn't through self-help strategies and stepped programming and, 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 and things like that, no. It's, it, the, the, it breaks my heart that churches in the city will we'll, we'll only receive that this morning and be told it's the gospel. Like there is resurrection power in the gospel that radically changes the life of a believer. And it transports them to a completely different place. That the glory of the Father brings resurrection to you, new life isn't just a pondering and treasuring up that truth in your heart. It's the kind, he says, that you walk in. It's that powerful that it can take over your entire life. It can do that. What do you think Lazarus' life was like for the rest of his life? What do you think his life was like? Do you think that he went anywhere that he didn't say, yeah, I, I was dead once? Uh, yeah, I'm that guy. I died. Jesus raised me to life. Right? Like that's, that's where Paul's trying to take us. That I was really dead and I have a new life. Now he died again. And if the Lord doesn't come back, we all will too. But, but this is a reality that he's trying to get us to grasp. Not just at a, at a head level not just at a head level. I bet Lazarus never became disconnected from the fact that he was actually dead and that the energy, that the power of the glory of the Father, the power of the Spirit, the work of Christ brought him back. I bet he never became disconnected from that, that each cell of his body that his spirit was alive in a whole different way. And the same is true of you, Christian. Grace abounds when you are united to Christ. And when grace abounds in our lives, when we, when we, we see that, when we get it, we realize we're dead to sin. That we're, we are dead to sin, but we're alive to God. Verse seven, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. It's not one or the other. We believe the, the same way about both. It's the same thing. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. And what I love about that, he's like, hey, maybe you can't believe for your, like you can't believe for yourself that you died to Christ and you're alive with him. What, but, but just look at Jesus. We know that Christ, let me just look at him. He was raised from the dead and he'll never die again. Amen? Amen. Like, I can believe that. Like, now that helps me. It helps me get there. 
that, that death no longer has dominion over Jesus. Amen? We believe that. Like when Jesus got out of that grave, he crushed death. He crushed it. It can't touch him. It, there, there's nothing, anything or anyone can do to Jesus Christ. He crushed it. He reigns. He is the champion. He has taken over in every way the dominance of this universe and creation. So that's, that's where, so I believe that about him. So now all I got to do is unite to him, right? Like that's all I got to do. That's, that's where my faith has to move. It has to move to him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. I struggle with dying to my sin. And I struggle every day with living, living alive to, to God, to Christ. But, but what I can do is look at Jesus. That's what I can do. So, verse 11, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Have you ever heard of the phrase, um, do you want the carrot or the stick? You ever heard of that? You want the carrot or the stick? Uh, I, I find that I say that all the time. I was thinking about this and I was like, I say that all the time. If you've been around me, you probably heard me say that. I don't know what that says about me, um, but it, it's one of my favorite idioms and it's like playing good cop and bad cop at the same time, right? It's like, which do you want? You want, you want, the, you want the good news or the bad news? And, that, and so Paul's like, he's, he's sort of been the confrontational voice in this issue of like how you handle grace like he's giving you the stick a little bit, right? Like you're, you, do you not know? Like he, but then like as this, as this passage travels through, it's all of a sudden like he's giving you the carrot, right? He's, which if you don't like carrots, it's a bad idiom, but um, some people do. So, so he, but he gives us the gift, right? He's like, he's okay. Like dead to sin, yes, but like we're talking about grace. And so now, so now he ushers in the good news that the outworking of our union with Christ in his death and, and, and new life is that now we can count ourselves, we can, we, can, we can count and consider and to reckon in our lives that, that, that we are alive to God. You're alive to him. You, you matter to God like you, you're in good standing with God, you're at peace with God through the gospel. You're part of what God's doing. Like, so it, he's asking us, hey, consider that, that this positional change is becoming a real life change. It's becoming something that you don't just know in your head, but you're starting to embody that reality. Consider also that what we just said about sin and dominion is also true about you. That sin has no dominion over you. Do you sin? Yeah. Do you struggle with sin? Yeah. Do you struggle with temptation of sin? Yeah. Does the devil mess with you in the area of sin? Yes. But the dominion of sin is no longer over the Christian. The dominion of it. It's like this is the good news that you also are alive to God in Christ Jesus. When darkness and chaos and bondage to, to sin existed, you're now free of those. You're now free of that bondage. There's no longer the penalty of sin in your life and God only corrects you with redemptive love. You, you need to feel that at the deepest place in your heart. The penalty of sin, if you believe in Jesus, is no longer over you. It's no longer condemning you. You've been freed from that, and God only, he only disciplines you. He only corrects you. He only talks to you, brother. He only talks to you, brother, in redemptive love. It's the only way he does it. And so when I'm condemning myself and I'm shaming myself and I'm whipping myself, he's not part of that. That's me doing that. Because I can't get out of the law. 
can't, can't get out of the thing that I think there has to be a penalty for this. Like, I, 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 I do bad things, and then I'm like, I'll take two weeks to kind of reconnect with the Lord because he doesn't want me around. Paul's like, this is not true. This is not God's grace. We're dead to sin, but we're alive to God. And that means being dead to sin is that our desires are being shaped because of the power of sin is losing its influence over our lives. That's what it means. And, and to be dead to sin but alive to God, like what that means is that we're recognizing by the power of the Spirit and by the wisdom given to us by brothers and sisters and by the Word of God that we're being given the ability to reconcile where things in our lives are incongruent or inappropriate with Christianity. Like, that, that, hey, that's, that's not what the Christian life should look like. Sometimes there's some tension there. It's like, man, the Bible doesn't really talk about social media. What do I do there? Like, I mean, there's some tension there, but that's, that's what it means to be dead to sin and alive to God, that God's actively working and shaping our lives. And it means that we're slowly moving away from sin. That's what it means. They, we, we're slowly moving away from it because it weakens us. He goes on in verse 12 to show us another beautiful reality. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Now, I just wanna point out something like that, that, that I find in Paul's teachings and sort of all the way through the New Testament and the gospels. And, and here, here's the truth. <laughs> here's the truth, take it, ponder it. Like think about it, like with your head, ponder it. And then, and then he's like, here's what you should believe in your heart about that. And then, and then after that, hey, here's how you should act. He just, it's sort of a natural progression. Here's the truth. Let me deal with how your heart's dealing with that. And at the very end here, we see words like let not, do not, right? Like we see those types of imperatives. And it's like, he's not stating these, Paul's not saying these so that we would like go, oh, I have to do these things in order to get God's grace or to keep God's grace or to experience God's grace, right? Like he's not saying that. He's saying, hey, when you've experienced God's grace, this is what it'll look like. And if you're sort of wondering with your little draft legs trying to stand up and you're like, hey, how do I, how do I, he's like, here, let me make it clear. Let not sin reign in your mortal body, which tells me that it doesn't reign. It tells me when he's saying, hey, John, don't let sin reign, he's saying, you're the one giving power to that. You're the one that's giving the power to sin to reign where it does not reign over you. It has no dominion over you. So God has provided all the grace to get out of that sin. He's provided every single path he's made a way and when there's no way, he'll make a way. He's given us that, which might even heap more shame on us because we're like, oh, I'm doing that, you know? But that's not his intent. His intent is for you to stand in grace, to realize that you're no longer enslaved and that you're no longer in sin and to not present your members, you, your body, like what you do. Don't, don't present that to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God. What a gift that God's done such a work in you that you could present yourself to God, the God of all creation, the holy, majestic, beautiful God, that you could, you could present yourself before God as an instrument of righteousness. That's how beautiful God has recreated you, how he's made you and how he's gifted you and what he's done in your life. To present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under the grace. And yet we see so many times 
when somebody is freed from prison and they spend a significant time incarcerated, that their chains are removed from their arms and their legs, but they can never get free of it in their mind. That's a reality, is that we still live in the bondage of that sin, and Paul's trying to wake us up by the revelation of who Christ is, his work, and what grace means for you. He's trying to wake us up this morning. Let not sin reign. The mind is full of ruts and and patterns and ways of being that must be renewed, that must experience transformation, where patterns emerge that are different from the patterns before. Sometimes we need a lot of help with that. It takes a lot of time most of the time but we're still under grace. We're still under grace and not the law, which says you need to whip yourself or somebody else needs to do something. Like we're still under that. And I love verse 13 as this sort of finishes up um, because he's like, hey, don't present yourselves as an instrument of unrighteousness. And we've talked several times about quorum Deo, about the Christian life is meant to be lived in the revelation that my whole life is lived before the face of God. There's not a bit of my life, not a bit of it that isn't lived before the face of God. Now my life is lived before the face of Amy. <laughs> Most of the time when I turn around, there she is. <laughs> and, and, and that matters, that relationship is um, beautiful and wonderful and um, sanctifying and gift-giving because of that. And, and, and quorum Deo means like so much more that you live, like I can go in the other room and get away from Amy and her get away from me, but quorum Deo, I never leave the face of God, that my whole life is lived before him in his presence united to him, and that identity is your inheritance, that you really are united to Christ, that that's a lived reality. And so he's saying because of that, because of grace's power in your life, live as an instrument of righteousness under grace, slowly, steadily, recognizing more of our sin, but being elated that God has saved us and is moving us away from that sin and towards kingdom building to the glory of the Father, to the glory of the Father, to resurrected Holy Spirit-enabled life. Paul's trying to awaken us to that. As, as As we deal with how sin is pardoned, and how we take up that, how we take up that gospel truth until it's subdued, which we'll talk about next week. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We ask, um, we ask God that, that you would give us one precious, precious gift. That this week, Lord, as we, as we come to the table of the Lord's Supper and we tear a piece of the bread off and we dip it into the juice as we share community and hellos with the people in line with us um, as we receive prayer up front as we respond through giving of tithes and offerings Lord I pray that you would inhabit the response of your people and the Lord as we're, we're sent from this place with a benediction, I pray that like we would experience unity with you that we've not experienced in a while. God, that we would that we would experience that. God, when 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 good things and blessings happen this week, Lord, I pray that 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 we would be quickened in that moment to realize that that's part of what you're doing in our life. Lord, if If there's difficult times this week, Lord, I pray that there'd be a reliance on you, that there'd be a refuge that we take in you and that we would know that is nowhere we have to go, but it's because we're united in that moment with you. So Lord, would you make that precious and true for your people? We pray in the name of Jesus, amen.